Um, so, um, welcome. This is sort of at the intersection of uh, the flute studio and musicology. Um, just to give a little credit where credit is due, this particular interest of mine got its start, I guess, about five years ago. And um, as a librarian, uh, I was sitting at home, and uh, I think this was after I parted ways with Duke, and uh, thought, hmm, there must be some stuff out there that I don't know about, and I went to Google and, and Googled flute special collections. Uh, and in fact, I found a special collection that I didn't know about, and I think very few people know about, which is the Hitchcock collection which belongs to the uh, Florida State University, um, which is in Tallahassee, where Laura Gale Green is the head of the library. And if you don't know about the Hitchcock Collection, which you, does anybody know about it? No. Okay. So there's a web page that will tell you about it. Uh, and it was uh, collected by um, General Hitchcock, who was a military man uh, living in uh, the South about 1830 or so, I think, uh, and was an amateur flutist and uh, evidently had enough money and enough connections to uh, make a really significant collection of flute music. Uh, it's mostly unaccompanied flute music or flute and piano, um, not so much in other genres like flute trios or quartets and so forth. Um, and this collection was uh, bound in beautiful leather bindings and was handed down in the family of his inheritors um, until about 25 years ago, I think. Uh, and it was in not only leather bindings, but we're thinking 75 big bound books. They were in a chest like this. So the chest came along with the, the volume inside. was given to the Florida State University. And uh, I think about 15 years ago, uh, the professor of flute at uh, Appalachian State University in Boone was doing her doctorate in musicology there. And she did a, uh, a catalog, uh, a complete catalog of what's in there which is good because it's not cataloged in any of our bibliographic utilities like WorldCat. So if you're looking for the material in this collection on WorldCat, you won't find it. Uh, and I only know what's in there because they sent me a, a, a Microsoft Word doc which had her catalog in it. So uh, I wrote them and said, would you please um, scan these items, and they scanned, oh, I suppose, about a thousand pages of stuff, and that kept me busy writing articles and articles <laughs> and articles because this is all unique material, almost all unique. It's not found any place else, uh, which I think is the fate of flute music: is that uh, if it's survived, it's only survived by chance, and the librarians have. Uh, not known it's out there because when we get something like the, this collection, imagine having somebody send you um, a box of stuff that has a thousand unique items that need to be cataloged. How long is that going to take the, the Overland Library to catalog a thousand things that need original cataloging? That's like a lot of cataloger years, right? So that's why it's not in, in WorldCat. At any rate, that's, that got my start on that. So uh, just to give you a little background, uh, and forgive me if I, you already know some of this stuff, uh, uh, I'll go over the stuff, I'll pass over the stuff that you may know, you know, so stop me if, you, if, it, if it seems too obvious. Uh, but uh, we're now a long way into the early music revival, uh, which from my point of view really got started in earnest in the 1970s. There was early music in the 50s and the 60s, but it really got going underway in the 70s. So the first time I ever saw uh, Traverso was probably in the late 70s. I saw uh, Bruggen play the concert where he played Traverso. 
Uh, he had been famous as a recordist, but he's not really known as a Toroso player. And uh, until 1980, it was very hard to get 18th century sources uh, uh, for flute music. Um, we started to have facsimile editions. Michael Lynn uh, published facsimile editions. Uh, I own some of those. There's also Space, um, Studio Per Edizione Schalte, um, get started in 1979. Performers uh, facsimiles a little bit later. Uh, so, I'm on the wrong, okay, am I on the right slide? Yes. So, we have this idea, we, we know that there's flute music from the 18th century, but um, if you talk to somebody who has a flute studio, or a professional flutist, the general thing that you will hear is, oh, we know there's this wonderful flute music in the 18th century, who, who knows any good music from the 19th century that you would want to play? Uh, and why is this? If you go and look for people who were composers for piano or strings, they don't write, write for flute. And that was the case for Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, Brahms. So we know there's, there's this wonderful piece by Schubert which was written for a Viennese flutist. But since Schubert didn't play the flute, he didn't write much flute music. So, the other thing that we think uh, in terms of dealing with 19th century flute music is it's all stupid, it's just virtuoso stuff, it's just scales and trills. Who would ever want to listen to this? It's not serious German music. So, the actual reality of the situation is that this period that I'm talking about today, 1800. 1850 was the richest period in terms of flute music in the history of the instrument. Before or since, there was not a period as rich as this. Why? Because we were at the intersection of uh, the development of a bourgeois culture where the people who had a certain amount of money and a certain amount of education could make their own music. Uh, there was a, a widespread music publishing industry based in Germany, France, England, Italy. Uh, the music, had, the instrument was still reasonably inexpensive. It could be played by an amateur and a talented amateur with, with enjoyment. So uh, there's a, a, a text I read which said, well, now here we are in 1810, and the, the level of performance, the level of technical demands that was acceptable as a professional level in 1780, that's not acceptable anymore. We have gone so far in the last 30 years in terms of what we can do on the flute. So this repertoire from 1800 to 1850 is larger than that for almost any other instrument, except for the piano, of course. Okay? The piano is is there because the piano will play with anyone. It's a ersatz orchestra. So uh, one of the things that would be surprising to most flutists is that there's a huge repertoire of unaccompanied pieces for flute. No piano, just very elaborate pieces for unaccompanied flute. We all know about the Bach Partita. We know about the Telemann Fantasias. But there are literally thousands of pieces of unaccompanied flute music, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about those later, um, which are very interesting, very demanding, that deserve to be part of the repertoire, just like the Telemann Fantasias. They're certainly on the level of the Telemann Fantasias. So not only do we have these, but we also have music for flute and piano, a huge repertoire for flute and guitar. That's going to be my next book. Uh, mm -hmm. Flute and string trio, what I think of as the flute quartet. We all play the Mozart quartets. But there are dozens, hundreds of other pieces like that uh, that we should be playing. <coughs> so, why do we have this disconnection between the actual reality and what our image is of the re actual reality? So, musicologists are rarely flutists. How many musicologists do we know that are flutists? Can you know that one? Uh, Howard Muir Brown, who's passed on to the great musicology meeting in the sky. 
uh, Neil Zaslaw, anybody else? That's probably about the list. So I went and looked in the Taruscan history now that you can do a keyword search. I looked for the word flutist. There is not a single flutist who is mentioned in this huge tome. Uh, there is one person who is a flutist who is mentioned. His name is Vladimir Usachevsky, who is not known as a performing flutist. He's known as a composer. That's the only one in the whole volume. Quantz doesn't appear. Nobody else. So flutists are also not usually musicologists. We don't get trained when we get trained as flutists to be musicologists. We get trained to master a repertoire that's been handed down to us from our teachers. Uh, and this repertoire tends to be <coughs> the repertoire that's sort of congruent with the Tafanella Gobert method, right? So let's say music between 1890 and 1920 for flute from France. So this repertoire that I was talking about from 1800 to 1850, there are virtually no editions of this repertoire, modern editions. Music librarians <coughs> tend, they don't know about this repertoire. And if it's in a library, it tends not to be cataloged. Uh, case in point, uh, not that I want to point fingers or anything. But uh, I went to look in WorldCat, and I found I was doing a very broad search, which is what you have to do to find this stuff. So I found this volume at the University of Houston that said, Music for Flute and Violin. That was all there was in the catalog record, just the title. And I called up the reference desk, and I said, excuse me, what is this? And they said, well, it's this big. They went and got it from the shelf, and they said, well, it's this big bound collection of music, but we don't really know what's in it. So I said, well, could you make a list? And they found one of the other volumes in the set. They had like 10 volumes, music for two flutes, music for flute and violin. And one of them actually had a contents note inside. So they photocopied that and sent it to me. And I searched it against WorldCat. None of those items were in WorldCat. So I said, please, 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 would you please catalog these, all of them, and put the records into WorldCat? And they did, bless their hearts. Uh, and now the person who isn't head of special collections has retired, and that's all as far as they're going to go. They digitized one volume, but the other nine volumes, which are unique material, are not digitized. So we have these things. They come down to us in these bound collections, usually. Michael has this wonderful collection, which we found on eBay. And I said, this is great, but I can't afford to buy it. And he said, I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and he had the thought, oh, it was for 500 euros. I'll offer him 400 and see if he bites. And he did. So that's why it's here and not in Florida. <laughs> uh, but this things, these things survive in these collections, because if they're in just unbound paper music, it's not going to get from 1850 to us. It has to be bound. Somebody has to have the value that makes them put it in a leather binding. So these things come into the library, and you have the bound with question. You have to make individual records for all of these things. And a lot of places don't do these, or they don't do them in a timely way. So there's Oberlin. Uh, FSU, as I mentioned, has this immense collection. It, none of it is in WorldCat. Now the material at Oberlin is in WorldCat. I was looking for things uh, at Harvard. They have a collection that was given to them by a, a cousin of the person, Robert Gould Shaw. Did you anybody see Glory, the movie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was a young man who was a Harvard student who was the leader of a black battalion which died terribly in an assault on a Confederate position. And there's a wonderful statue of this man and his battalion on Boston Common, very well known. And I discovered that there was this collection of flute music, which actually I thought it was him, but it was his cousin who gave his collection of 19th century flute music to Harvard in 1890. It's in the library. It hasn't been cataloged yet. 
you know, we're 125 years after the donation, and it still has been cataloged. The only reason I know about it, because somebody published an article that said, uh, some uncatalogued music resources in the Harvard Theater Collection, and then she listed sort of collection level information, and that's it. Uh, so you can't even find what there is unless you go to Harvard and look at it on site. Okay, I won't spend much time talking about this instrument because we're celebrating the French uh, instrument of this period. Just to say that uh, we're already in a very international period. So even if the French are playing the French instruments and the English are playing the English instruments and the Germans are playing their German instruments and they all have national characteristics, there's a lot of traveling between the, the various places. Uh, both in terms of the instruments themselves, but particularly in terms of the repertoire. So even if something is published in France originally, it ends up being published in Germany, or if something is published originally in England, it ends up being published in Germany, and so forth. So just to give you a quick demo, this looks, I would say, like a French flute. Uh, it's a four key, uh, probably from about 1815. Uh, made, but it's made by a, a person with a French surname working in New York City, Pelo Bay. So it's a very, very light instrument. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's pretty similar to these two slightly later French instruments. The only difference really is that these have tuning slides and the Pelo Bay does not. And I just brought this along because uh, I picked this up on eBay for about $40. And uh, it looks to me like an English instrument, but you could more also maybe think it's German. It's certainly not French, though. It has these uh, pewter patented, potter patented pewter plugs, um, which are typical of English flute making. So. Doesn't look especially English, but maybe it's an American maker. Uh, so this is, these are essentially the instruments that this immense repertoire is intended for. Whether it's a four key flute, or a six key flute, or a five key flute, or an eight key flute. Uh, the number of people who are playing Burm instruments, once they had started to be made, uh, was small. Uh, and it only started to grow by the end of the 19th century, and even in the 20th century, there were a lot of people who were still playing eight key instruments. I have an eight key at home that was made by Kurler in Czechoslovakia, and Czechoslovakia didn't exist until 1918. So, so when I first gave this lecture, uh, my host at the University of New Hampshire said, you're not going to talk about all 50 of these people, are you? <laughs> uh, and, and I said, no, I just want to frighten the, the audience a little bit. Uh, so we have this myth that there's no flute music from the 19th century. And these 50 are only from the first half of the 19th century, which is the major part in terms of uh, the production. So. <coughs> I would say these are maybe the 50 most prominent. Uh, there may be a few people that uh, didn't get on there, but almost all of them are the most prominent. And you can see there's a pretty good balance between English, French, German, and even Danish. Uh, I put in next to the, the names, can you read those from where you're sitting? The ones who are in Grove, <coughs> I put in Grove. And you can see that uh, it's a pretty small proportion. On this page, there's five or six. Uh, and these composers are all composers for whom I have personally looked at, photocopied, played music by them. Uh, so these are not just names in a dictionary. These are names that are attached to surviving pieces in, in libraries. 
and most of them for which I have PDFs on my hard drive. So we have a whole bunch of flutists and some musicologists and librarians here. Do you know any of these names? <laughs> Who looks familiar? Tulu? Susman? Wunderlich? Right? So there's actually some Valkyrs being published now. There's all his sonatas for flute and piano. Wunderlich, uh, there's the Hugo Wunderlich method. Um, we know him because he was active at the conservatory. Um, there seemed to have been um, a, a plague of French flutists going nuts and killing themselves. Um, uh, either uh, dying of venereal disease or throwing themselves out windows. Anybody know who threw themselves out the window? Uh, <laughs> look it up. <laughs> oh, oh, come on. <laughs> well, I don't want to make my make that an incorrect statement, but yeah, one of them did. Uh, I think it was Hugo, as a matter of fact. I think he threw himself out the window. Uh, so Zussmann is known why because of his exercises, right? He has a huge. Uh, volume of, of sort of difficult and boring exercises. But he actually also produced a lot of unaccompanied uh, wonderful pieces for flute, uh, large-scale sonatas. They're pieces in large dimensions for unaccompanied flute uh, in three movements. Uh, and there's some later works which are in really uh, punishing keys, F minor, I think even somebody who loves playing the, the A key flute is not going to be happy about playing an F minor. <laughs> no. So most of these people are not known, and can, we can only get their music um, from digging it out of libraries and, and asking people to send things. So how can we get a global view of what was available during this period? Uh, there is a wonderful German bibliography. Everybody knows that the Germans are the, the, the scientists, the systematic folk in, in, in musicology. Uh, so there was this uh, Handbuch, uh, first edition 1817, later edition 1828, the final edition 1844 to 1845, and then after that it was just supplements that were published to the 1845 edition. And it's uh, classified so that you can see that the most important stuff comes first, and then the less important stuff comes later. So first there's music for large ensemble, strings and winds. Then there's music for large ensemble, winds only, violin, viola, cello and contrabass, and the four professional string instruments. And after that, flute is the very first thing that comes up. Uh, Soon and Serpent are together. Chacon. We have a trumpet is and trombone are in the, the section with Oath Clyde. So if we look at each of these classifications, we can see how many pages there is for each section and give a, get a relative count, even if we don't have to count the number of items, we can just count the number of pages and see what there is. So there's uh, three pages of flute uh, charity, three pages of uh, larger chamber music, four pages of quartets, two pages of trios. Then when we get down to uh, duos, we have eight pages of pieces for two flutes. That's just two flutes because the stuff for piano and flute is in another classification entirely. And then solos for the flute, nine and a half pages. So the pieces for flute unaccompanied are vastly outnumbering things for ensembles, which makes a certain amount of sense. And this doesn't include studies or instructional books. It's just concert pieces to play. Uh, so if you look at the the comparison, violin has 37 pages, viola 2, <laughs> clarinet has 5 pages, 
So there's six times the amount of music for flute that there is for clarinet. <coughs> Everything else is only 11 pages. And this is an interesting fact here. 38 pages of pieces for guitar. Nobody would ever think that there's 38 pages of serious classical music for guitar from this period, but <coughs> I think the guitar and the flute, in a certain sense, served the same purpose. They were music that you could make by yourself at home, uh, and that's why there's so much of it available. Yeah, solo violin. There's only three pages of pieces for solo violin. So, uh, for this iteration of, of the lecture, I went to see where the pieces in this handbook were published. And by and large, it's just German-speaking areas. Milan is there because it's part of Austria at the time. Uh, so, even if there's a lot of French music in this collection, it doesn't cover the things that were published in Paris at all or the things that were published in England at all. But unfortunately, the English and the French didn't make systematic bibliographies at this time. So just to give you an idea of how many people were writing pieces for flute, I went through the, all the names <laughs> in the handbook for flute. And there's well over 500 people writing pieces that are original compositions for flutes, not arrangements. And there's another 70 that are arrangements of pieces by other composers. Uh, so, and I've just given you the bees, so take a quick look at the bees here. Again, not so many of them that we know. Ricciardi, Boxa, and that's about it. So, that was 80, 1845. Uh, by the early 20th century, we have uh, uh, an interesting work called The Catechism for the Flute, which was produced by Schwedler. Everybody who is into historical instruments knows that he was, uh, had a particular design that he liked to play. Uh, and he played this improved conical bore simple system flute. And he held some pretty important jobs. Uh, principal flute at the Gewandhaus, uh, taught at the Leipzig Conservatory, in spite of the fact that he did not play Berm flute. 1908 to 1932, the principal flute professor in Leipzig does not play Berm flute. Uh, so he published this uh, work about what you need to know to play the flute. And it includes a repertoire list. Uh, so here's a list of uh, exercises and, and methods. And there are some things that are familiar if you can make it up. Anderson, all the Anderson etudes. Uh, there's some Pummer here. Uh, the Hugo and Wunderlich is still being used. Fürstenau, Berbiguet. So this repertoire from the early uh, 19th century is still somewhat known in the early 20th century. So, for example, let's see, Kufner, Kurler, Kummer, uh, all these early, uh, Leonhard von Kahl, these early 19th century names. But it's a pretty small number of, uh, of people that are represented. So. Just to say that it's already in the early 20th century that this music is, is being forgotten. Uh, and it certainly was already forgotten by and large by the French in the early 20th century. They were completely not interested in this material. Uh, so since we're talking about French music in particular, I will focus uh, on them as we whip through the remaining 49 names here. Uh, but just this first slide, uh, 
is a piece by an English composer which survives in the manuscript of Mr. Hitchcock. Not only did he collect this many volumes of printed music, but he also copied a lot out in his own manuscripts. So, including a lot of uh, Celtic uh, tunes with elaborate variations. And a lot of this stuff only survives in these manuscripts, as far as I know. Just a moment to speak about Belka. Uh, this is, I think, one of the great forgotten flutists of the early 19th century. Uh, he, his brother was a very well-known trombonist and composer. Belka didn't write an awful lot, but what he did write was very high quality. Uh, this is from his uh, second set of pieces. The first is published in a modern edition. This one is not, and you can't even find the, the photo on the internet anywhere. Uh, but uh, I have a friend who sent it to me. <laughs> and the final composition in this collection of caprices is a very um, effective and wonderful arrangement of the uh, Bach uh, chromatic fantasy and fugue for solo unaccompanied flute. Uh, imagine playing that on your eight key flute. There's a wonderful video of somebody playing that piece on a historical flute. So, Mr. Belk, if you want a copy, I'll send it to you in the email. Uh, Bequier, he was a, uh, most of these French flutes studied at the conservatory. He was a very fine composer, died in his uh, 20s. There are very few of these uh, that survive. This is from your collection here at Oberlin. Uh, there's uh, another piece of his that's in the collection at Berkeley. Um, maybe two or three of these things you can get a hold of. Berbiguet. <coughs> Berbiguet was, I would say, the first uh, generation of students <coughs> from the Paris Conservatory. So the early professors there were Wunderlich, <coughs> Hugo. He was the first one to go through that curriculum. And uh, he starts publishing in the early 19th century. There's a, his opus one is a very difficult set of um, solos or studies. Uh, so there are studies, but not in the sense of the you know, boring studies that we play, where the interest is just getting the fingers to work. Uh, it's said in one of the sources that he was a better composer than uh, he was a player that maybe he didn't play as well as the pieces that he composed. This is a late piece, kind of hard to see, isn't it? Uh, a set of uh, variations on national airs. This is a Portuguese tune, uh, and it's uh, from an English print. So in spite of the fact that he was trained and worked most of his life in Paris, he did visit England, and uh, the music is published for English players to, to play. And I think there's the evidence that would support the notion that he's writing down to the English in a certain sense, uh, because the French flutes tend to play well at the top of their register, and they don't have such a, a big sound at the bottom, and the French English flutes are the other way around. So if you look at uh, the music by Nicholson, the music he's writing tends to stick down in the lower registers and not exploit the top. Camus. Uh, there's a, a large number of very interesting pieces, uh, mostly operatic fantasies, uh, by Camus, who was one of the first the early adopters of the burn flute. Uh, this is from the Hitchcock collection. Uh, this is uh, Michael's new best friend, right? Mr. <laughs> Cosnese. Uh, and uh, he, uh, another, he's another French musician. He, this is Opus 48, Six Fantasies uh, uh, on the Postillon de Longjumeau by Adolphe Adam. Uh, so if you do the math, if there's 
opens 48, and there's six fantasies in here. There's at least 300 individual pieces. And some of these sets have 12, not just six. Uh, uh, there's dozens of these pieces in the Hitchcock collection, which is probably the single biggest source. Uh, I think I found one modern edition of one piece by him. Uh, and these are uh, very effectively written for the flute. You can maybe see the blackness on, on the score there. He's somebody who really needs to be rediscovered. Drouet. Um, Michael has a Drouet ivory flute. Uh, and this particular set, uh, the Petit de Création, uh, this is uh, taken from a copy of the Hitchcock Collection in Florida. The original publication um, was uh, by, I can't remember her name, Madame something or other, <laughs> which was issued uh, about 1810. So this is actually, I think, the very earliest surviving piece, uh, pieces by Drouet. And interestingly enough, if you try to play them on an A key flute, they use the keys very little. You can get by with very little use of the, the supplementary keys. They're very black. And not only that, but they're also very high. So you really need an instrument where it just pings out the, the top register. And the, the number of, of leaps from the low to the high, it's ungrateful to play on a modern Miyazawa. But if you're playing it on, uh, on something that's nice and light, it just flies off the fingers. It's really nice. Uh, it gives you an idea of why he was considered to be perhaps the greatest virtuoso of the flute. We're going to hear some virtuoso Drouet later today. Uh, just a moment about Mr. Ellis von Mariton. So, the, he, set, he published a set of uh, 15 variations by Dufault uh, et Dubois. And there, this is the only piece of his that's listed in this enormous uh, whistling handbook. Only one piece. And I thought, who is this guy? And I went to dig around. And I found that, in fact, if you go to the, the catalog for the National Library in France, you have all these pieces uh, in the National Library in France, none of which have been published. I couldn't get a hold of a score by Mr. Ellis Mont-Mariton. Uh, but it's, you know, variation brillante with piano, fantasy pastoral. I'm sure that within these 24 opuses, there's some good material, but we can't get our hands on it yet. Because it's not in Gallica, uh, the National Library in France is kind of slow in what they're putting online. Just a, a brief moment about Mr. Ernst. This is the most important flutist in the United States in the, in the 19th century. He was from uh, Germany. He published extensively in Germany, and then he moved to uh, England. He was also a flutist and guitarist. So uh, he wrote the set of 20 operatic pieces for flute with a guitar accompaniment. Uh, there's also a wonderful set of eight uh, variations on familiar tunes from Freischutz, which came out the year that Freischutz was issued. Then he moved to the United States, and he was a burn flute teacher for the rest of his life uh, in New York City. <laughs> he was the host for Drouet when Drouet came there in the mid-19th uh, century. But in spite of the fact that he's the leading American flutist, he can't get his music in a published edition, and nobody's ever heard of Mr. Ernst, although he lived in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. We even know where his, his studio was. Gatterman, uh, wonderful, difficult music. There's a bunch of flute duets. There's a, a flute method. There's an extensive set of exercises. Uh, and again, you can pick this stuff up on eBay for 30 or $40. Um, our library should be collecting this stuff. And as far as I know, nobody's doing it. Uh, uh, Gebauer, French, he was from a f uh, family of um, wind musicians. Uh, they had a, a, the 
four brothers that had a quartet, flute, oboe, horn, and bassoon. Uh, and uh, they played concerts together. And this is the flutist. Lots of wonderful and difficult and, and uh, musically delightful variations on, on popular tunes. <coughs> Dozens of these. Uh, here's a, a military uh, composer, Oradu. This is from um, Brigham Young University, I think is where this is in my collection. Uh, again, variations on themes with the flute. Le Plus, uh, he's sort of the next generation of conservatory trained French composers. This is from Michael's manuscript. Uh, there's this wonderful set of unaccompanied melodies. There's 30, 30 of them, uh, opus 10, and Michael's manuscript has the first 15. You also have the printed edition, right? Of, of the, only of the first 15. Only of the first 15, because it was published in two seconds. <clears throat> so we still don't have access to the second part of the set. But they're wonderful pieces. That, and um, for people who were maybe a little bit less taken by virtuoso display, they're musically very rewarding without being so killerly difficult. Miramont. Uh, he's a slightly later uh, generation, say 1840, 1850. There's uh, wonderful sets of pieces of operatic uh, arrangements, uh, pieces uh, that are arrangements of uh, romances. Usually these things are not just straight arrangements, but they have elaborate variations. That's a, a set of uh, etudes. Uh, Jacques. Uh, he studied at the conservatory and uh, he did not, it was not a success, so he died tragically at an early age, but even so he managed to publish 15 or 20 uh, items in Paris before he came to his early demise. There's a wonderful uh, obituary which tells of his tragic passing. Uh, Rémy Zah, and uh, maybe I'll list, leave it there once I talk a little about Rémy Zah. Mr. Rampal had this flute that was made for Rémy Zah uh, by Louis Lowe in gold. Uh, you may have seen the picture of it. And Rémy Zah was actually famous for not wanting to play the bird flute for most of his life. <clears throat> but uh, he left Paris and went to Shanghai and established conservatory there and had concerts of Western music in Shanghai. And his Chinese students purchased this Louis Lo flute in gold uh, for his 80th birthday, I think. Uh, so it was the sort of thing that people didn't do in Paris, leave the center of the world and go to Shanghai. But Remiza did. So his music is most of all, mostly published before he left for Shanghai. Uh, I don't think there's anything that we have from him after he went there, but he was an important figure in bringing this music to Shanghai. So I, I think that will give you an idea of the number of composers that there are out there and how much there is waiting to be discovered and played. Um, the, the number I gave you of 500 from the Whistling Han book is certainly on the very low side because, as I said, it doesn't cover Paris. Or, in, uh, or London, which are two of the major centers of publishing. So the number of individual composers writing pieces intended for the flute is probably around a thousand for this period, of whom we know five or six. Thank you, and I'll open up to questions. I was curious, Tom, if. Uh... <coughs> Uh, you've seen our program for tonight, mm -hmm. uh, and it was striking me that a lot of the pieces on that program are probably a 20th or 21st century premiere. Absolutely. That, because they're not available in any modern edition. Yes. Like, what, are, are there, what pieces 
would have would be known. So that the Tulu Grand Sonata, that's probably available in a modern edition. The things that tend to be published in modern editions from this period are almost exclusively the exercises. So the Verbigay exercises are available. Um, the Sus, you already knew about Susman, the Susman exercises are available. Uh, the uh, Garibaldi is slightly later, he, but he was already working in, in Paris in the 1850s. Uh, we know his exercises. Everybody's played the Garibaldi exercises, yes? Is there anybody that hasn't played the Garibaldi exercises? But his concert music is unknown. Uh, so we're not interested in the concert music because we have this notion that it's not rewarding. We don't expect exercises to be rewarding musically. They don't have, you know, we don't expect them to sound like Schumann or Beethoven. We expect them to do what they need to do in terms of developing their technique. Uh, but, yeah, when I go and buy a piece of music on eBay, and I'm a poor librarian, so I'm not spending a lot of money, but when I go and buy one of these things for 30 or 40 dollars, almost every single one that I get, when I get it, I search to see whether there's a copy of it in, in eBay or in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Almost always there is no copy. I have the world's only copy. So uh, it's not difficult to find material that has never been republished in the, in the 20th century or the 21st century. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Other questions? Do you think this gap that you point to between the perception of the period and the reality of the period is something that's in general true for a number of other instruments, or is this pretty flute specific? It's certainly the case for guitar. Uh, absolutely the case for guitar. There's a huge volume of music for guitar. And again, guitar was not a serious instrument for the 20th century. Um, our, our explorations as musicologists tend to be focused on a few very highly prestigious areas. Uh, so, uh, and if it's not prestigious, we don't want to know about it. I remember hearing two musicologists laughing about another musicologist many, many years ago. And they were saying, ah, oh, he's going to study Donizetti, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in the sense that, how could anybody study something so beneath value and dignity. You know, we should be studying Wagner and not Donizetti. Now we think, okay, Donizetti is part of the canonical composers. But the, the, the situation for opera from this period is not any better. If you think about the, the volume of French opera that was world famous and world popular that's, uh, that's used in these fantasies. For example, uh, Boisdieu, La Dame Blanche, who has ever seen a performance of La Dame Blanche? And yet, it was one of the most successful operas from this period. Uh, so, you know, what we do as musicologists and what we study is socially determined by where we are right now. I remember talking to another eminent musicologist in, in the 90s and talking about Shostakovich, and he said, Shostakovich, ooh, is, is that really? Isn't it just socialist garbage? You know, I, this was from a professor at Princeton who taught, I won't tell you who he taught, but you know, that was the received wisdom about that particular repertoire. Um, now, you may not think that he's your favorite composer, but I would say he's certainly not infra dignitatem to be thinking about him as the serious contributor. So, uh, I wonder if if genre itself plays into this, and since you've got this global view of this, of this 19th century <coughs> repertory, is it possible, I think, for instance, in other wind, wind traditions, how much of it's devoted to either kind of competition piece or theme and variations that 
theme and variations seem, seem to be particularly cliched and dated that I could understand why, even though at its time, theme and variations might have had a, a, a particular viability, I can understand how it might not have survived because of the genre. So I guess the question is, in, in, in the global view of what you've got, you, you put, put forth really compelling reasons why we've got the, 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 the gap between knowledge and, and reality. Does the genre itself play, play into this? If you were to look at the genre of these 50 uh, composers, uh, are they writing in, in forms that we would be resistant to? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and I would say that, um, again, that's where we come from as the inheritors of the Germanic Viennese musicological edition. <coughs> what we value as um, music scholars are forms like sonata and symphony. Uh, and this is not by and large the forms that they're writing in. Um, there are uh, a lot, there is a certain repertoire, mostly by Germanic composers, but also by Valkyrs, for example, of pieces that are in sonata form for blues and piano, but they're certainly not the majority. So <coughs> what we think of as serious is sonata form that we can put into our, our Marxian, A.B. Marxian boxes, right? And, and think about them as as serious, because we don't think about the development of uh, a set of variations as serious unless it's Beethoven. <laughs> it's, you know, because Beethoven is, has, has put his mark on it, it's serious. <laughs> um, but you know, a lot of this music is highly serious. Uh, but it's not in their genomic forms. Uh, you know, I could talk, I talked about French composers, so I could have talked a little bit more about the, the Germanic composers. Um, <coughs> the uh, Sussmann, who was a German composer who was active in, in St. Petersburg, the large scale pieces that he writes, in fact, are not <coughs> by and large variations, but there's uh, nine large scale sonatas uh, for unaccompanied flute, just flute, unaccompanied flute. Um, and imagine a large sonata form piece for just solo flute, um, that's a pretty austere thing to be doing. <laughs> so yeah, I think also, if you want to talk more generally, um, we still don't respect French music. Uh, we respect Italian opera, if it's by Verity. We respect uh, German symphonies and German uh, instrumental music, mostly piano and string quartet. And that's about it. We don't have any respect for French grand opera. Uh, when are we ever going to see Meyerbeer or Boileau or Aubert? Aubert is a fabulous composer, but I don't know anybody who's produced a recent monograph on Aubert. Uh, and there certainly are very few recordings of it. Uh, there's a very nice recording of La Muette de Portici. Um, which is one of the popular sources for instrumental pieces in this repertoire. Uh, but there aren't many others. Yes? Oh, so I'm just a little <coughs> overloaded right now with all this information. And um, so I'm wondering where, if I want to find something, say, for, to play on my 6-key pottery flute, um, where would I go? <laughs> no, seriously. The trip to Florida? No, no, no. Just send me an email. I'll send me an email. I'll send you the PDF within 24 hours. How do I know what I want, though? I mean, it's so much. So, so much. go and look at my articles at my academia site. I, I've been writing little articles, little sort of bibliographical articles for the past five years, exactly because this information is not available anywhere. Um, I've talked to the people who write Grove, and, uh, or edit Grove, and you know they have a very strict limit on what they consider to be Grove worthy. Uh, so these people are not in Grove, not perhaps because they don't know about them, but because they have a prejudice against them. Uh, so if you want to find a works list, 
Good luck. <laughs> and uh, there's a wonderful composer by the name of Jules Hermann. You maybe have, has anybody seen the uh, the arrangement of the Paganini uh, uh, capriccios for flute? You know that? Some, anybody know those? Uh, he he did the arrangement. Uh, and but there's also like a hundred opera, hundred opuses of his his material. <laughs> Very few of which are available, but they're all at the National Library in Paris. I, I have one of them in my personal collection, <laughs> um, but I don't have the other 99. Uh, but now I've forgotten where I was going. But uh, you're saying he's a good composer. Yeah, there's no works list. There was no works list. You couldn't find a works list anywhere. So I published a works list as best as I could do. Uh, I, I'm curious, actually, since you used the phrase "grow for the." It, are these people, for instance, in Grove One? It's 1880. Grove, or am I going to find these people there? Are they in either? Uh, I confess I didn't look because the main place that you can go and find this information, the most uh, encyclopedic coverage is in Fetis. Fetis has a biography of almost everybody, and sometimes it's in the later edition. And he almost always gives a, a fairly detailed works list. So it at least gives you a, an idea of what there was, or what he had. A, in their day, they were grove or they were fake Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, but it's, I think it's kind of pathetic <laughs> in 2015 that we have to go to Fetis to find out the state of knowledge about any of these guys. You know, Remy Zah? I mean, he's always not in Grove. Uh, he's a fabulous composer. There's little thumbnail and small um, biographies of some of these folks. You know, Leonardo de Lorenzo, uh, book if you're familiar with that. Yes, they're and, usually about two sentences. Right. right. Well, he's got one section with, it, with really, little, really little ones, but then there's another section where there's slightly bigger that has a little bit more. So, it's, uh, and the, the NFA edition that uh, put an index in it which makes it actually a useful book. The original had no index. Well, of course, now you can search it through. But now you can search it. Now at least right. there's an insect in index and you can look up these composers. So the, I recognize some of these from there. Not all of them, of course, but that he was you know, early 19th or early 20th century in the US. So some things made their way across. So this is a little bit. Right, right. Well, and these things are in our libraries. <coughs> But it's sort of haphazard. They're not often cataloged, and if they are cataloged, they're not well cataloged. And if they're well cataloged, they're not digitized. So, for example, one of the sources that I would love to get my hands on is there's a bound collection of some very interesting stuff that's not elsewhere at Trinity College in Hartford. Um, and I've begged them to you know, send it to me on interlibrary loan photocopy and make a scan something. There's a Monzani sec, uh, set of, uh, we didn't talk about Monzani <laughs> at all, set of pieces by Monzani, um, which are uniquely there in the United States. I can't find any other copy. But <clears throat> I haven't, I live in Florida. If I lived in Boston, I would drive down there with my digital camera and snap, 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 snap. But I can't get the people on the other end to, to do this. You know, sometimes I can. John Shepard at Berkeley, you know, has been very good about pulling stuff off the shelf. Uh, but it's just tough. Tell me about IMSLP. So why is this stuff not an IMSLP? Well, they, some of it is. Some of it you, is. You can look a lot of these composers up in IMSLP. But usually it's one or two pieces because things only get into IMSLP if you put them in. So I, I could, you know, but actually, um, the stuff that I own personally, I'm putting it, scanning and putting it into the FIU digital repository. So we've got 400 pieces for flute there. Um, so go there, don't download it all. Um, and uh, I should I should say also the. The collection that Oberlin owns, the, uh, it's basically eight volumes, four flute volumes, four piano volumes of pieces for flute and piano, 
which includes all of the flute and piano pieces that are on the concert tonight. Those have all been scanned and they are available online. Um, you have to go to, what is it, to the archives site and then there's a search page in the archives site and then you search for flute. You can do it that um, way or they're linked through Ovis now from each individual record. Okay. It is very difficult. But that's a, like 115. Even as a pieces. talented library searcher, it's very difficult to find this stuff because yeah. if you go and look for it in, in WorldCat, it's very difficult to sort out what are these original sources. Uh, and if they are there, maybe you can't get access them to them because they're hot, hot to trust only. Um, <coughs> uh, so we're at the sort of very beginning stages. One of the other ma major problems is that RISM, uh, uh, this encyclopedic guide to musical sources, only goes to 1800. And anything after 1800, you're on, on your own. Uh, which is why, you know, if, if these people were publishing in 1750, I could say, well, according to RISM, this is what there is. But even these, the sources that we can use, the secondary sources, they don't cover all this stuff. This manuscript that, that Michael got, um, you know, some of it is in editions in, in French libraries, and some of it is not. Some of it is only there, and uh, it's in his personal collection. You know, there's not a published index, uh, and you know, it's not available online yet. Uh, so, it's a difficult situation, and uh, the other thing I think that uh, a major impact is that uh, Positivist, positivistic musicology has had a bad reputation for about 50 years. Nobody wants to do bibliography. Nobody wants to determine facts of death and, and birth and marriage and, and all that kind of stuff. They'd rather talk about literary theory and gender theory and then and then. So the people who would be doing this work um, won't get jobs because it's not a sexy thing to be doing. Um, and there's a, you know, what we can do is dependent on what our economic circumstances are. And if we don't have a job where we can spend at least part of our time and get some social um, capital from what we do, it ain't going to get done. Uh, so I, I, went, I went once for an interview at a prestigious university as a librarian and was meeting with the, the musicology faculty there, and I had just had a 40-page article published in MLA Notes, which was an annotated catalog of 19th century music. And they said, isn't that rather librarianly? Um, and it was librarianly, but the problem is that uh, this is not the sort of thing that is, is prestige, given prestige by musicology at this point. And it certainly is hard to do it as a, a full-time librarian. So, and if Grove is not going to publish this, this you know that's a serious disincentive to be producing articles with work lists. You know because it would make sense. Where do people go to find work lists? They go to Grove. You know I want to see what Mozart did. I want to see what's been published. But you can't find this information about any of these folks. Again, because musicology at our point in our time is not privileging positive. You know, interestingly, uh, there's a lot that happens uh, through Facebook in, in these subject matters. Tom has a Facebook group called 19th Century Flute History. Is that right, correct? Flute with a historical focus, right? Yeah, and, and he posts, and sometimes other people post, um, PDFs on an almost daily basis of repertoire. I right. Mean, so just I collect that. It's a huge amount of music right there. There's, there's, there's no way that people do not have plenty of music to play. I mean, maybe you don't have all 30 opuses of, of Remisol, but you, you can get a huge amount of music. 
right. English, and, German, and French. And as we move along, I, I think people will continue to digitize this yeah, material, more and more. just sort of at the very early phases. Yeah. Uh, and yes, people, uh, communication between scholars is no longer by a, 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 a communication in the pages of, of jams. <laughs> That's just not how it works anymore. Uh, even for the people who would publish in jams. Uh, you know, there's a site for the 15th century scholars and a site for the 16th century scholars on Facebook. Uh, and this Belka collection, I wouldn't have known about the fact that this person owned it and was willing to send it to me if I hadn't put it in my group. Geez, I really wonder, how can I get a hold of this Belka, this other Belka collection? Because I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, and he said, oh, I have it. I'll send it to you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, there are two really good groups. There's Tom's group, the 19th century group, and then the other one is called the Flute History Channel. Is that right? Right, right. And, and that's an extremely good group. That's got about 2,000 people in it, all of whom are interested in, in early flutes and history and repertoire. So when I gave this talk the last time, um, the very first question is, what, why don't you publish this stuff? And my answer was, because there's no market for this music anymore. If anybody can get this music for free, they're not going to pay for it. The only people who would buy it would be libraries, and libraries don't have enough money to buy anything anymore. Uh, so we live in the best of times and the worst of times. There's no market for this stuff. But you can get it for free from your friends. Uh, and then, you know, we can, I, you know, I grew up in the way, way old days when if you wanted to get a piece of uh, a sonata by some recorder composer like Veracini, you would have to go to the music store and you would pay $10 for a one piece in, in a printed edition. And that was when, you know, you could get a six pack for about 50 and you could get on the subway for 25 cents. So that was a lot of money in those days. And the, the idea that I can have more music on my hard drive than any physical library in the world can have on their shelves. You know, I know what a, a good library like Princeton or, or Oberlin or Duke has on their shelves in terms of flute repertoire. And this stuff is not on there. <laughs> not, any, not any place like the number of things, you know. 48 opuses by Cartonese, that's not on anybody's shelves. And not any anything remotely. If you look at the section of M62 for a solo flute, it's like this big. If you're at a big library, it's like this big. But it should be like <laughs> that big. So <clears throat> really, it's wonderful. You can print it all out, but you're not going to be able to buy a printed edition from a music store because those things don't exist anymore. What? That is true. I know, I said on that cheery note. On that cheery note, it is a cheery note. I never imagined I could have this much music. Have you made a proposal to AR editions for them? I wonder if an edition or in their um, digital collection. Yeah, but I don't, you know, I talked about space before. Space was wonderful. I, you know, I have several dozen pieces you know, of their things. But they're going out of business. They're, they're, they're roll, rolling the rug up and closing the door. You know? Yeah. Yeah, they were selling all their editions at half price. What does that mean to you? Now, all so the, biggest, the biggest facsimile companies, um, Space and, and Minkoff, which went out of business about 15 years ago. We individuals are not buying, and the libraries are not buying. So they just can't do it. It's not going to happen. But luckily, we can get it all for free. Right. <laughs> you just have to. But, yeah. So I guess my just get it on the computer. Be, talk to your librarians and tell them, forget about buying any modern editions unless it's the most leading composers who are alive now. But don't be buying editions of Schubert. You know, spend your money digitizing the stuff that you have that is in the public domain and make it available to the whole world, because. Every single library has at least one of these things, you know, like Trinity College that won't do it, or 
the University of Houston that won't do it. I said, I called them and I said, you know, you did this two years ago, can you, can you do some more? No, no, we haven't got the money. Uh, there are other things in the pipeline. Uh, and these are unique things. If they were stolen or burned, they would be lost forever. If this collection in the Hitchcock collection in Florida, if something happened to that, they've, I have half of, you know, I have a thousand pages of it on my hard drive. But they, they should do that tomorrow, tonight. <laughs> because if it's gone, it's gone forever. It will be as gone as the Telemann Gamba <laughs> fans were yeah. for the last 300 years. Mm -hmm. Those, did you see those were just rediscovered? One copy of the missing Telemann 12 Gamba f fantasies was rediscovered and is going to be published. But if you had wanted to play that between now <laughs> and the time that he published it, you would have been out of luck. You know? It was in a private collection. Somebody found a copy of it. Like I said, all you have to do is buy one of these things and you realize you have the only copy in the world. Uh, one more little story, and then I'll let Michael get ready. Um, I was haunting eBay, and there was a woman who was a uh, eBay vendor from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Anybody know where that is? That's where the Amish are, right? And so she sold stuff like crafts and so forth, you know, Amish crafts. And she put this ad and said, <clears throat> Four pounds of music. <laughs> and it was $30 for four pounds of music. And she put a couple of, maybe four or five photos of what it was in. And in the little you know, note she put at the top, four pounds of music, use it for crafts or play it. Oh. You know, so she was like, take this and cut it up, make some sort of craft thing with like old timey music. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> Because I could see that this was 19th century flute music. So I sent away my $30, <clears throat> and the box came, and I opened it up, and there was 12 individual pieces, and eight of which were not in any library anywhere. And it was, uh, most of it was high quality concert music. There's a composer by the name of J.S. Cox was active in, in Philadelphia in the late 19th century. He ended up playing with the Sousa Band for a while. There's a, uh, there's a volume of operatic fantasies that somebody has digitized uh, in archive.org. But I got like four pieces by him for flute and piano, like a, a set of variations on Robin Adair, a set of variations on um, some 19th century Christian hymn, you know, Jesus, na 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 na. Um, <clears throat> but in this sort of 19th century operatic fantasy style. And I realized I have the only surviving copy of these pieces by a noted American composer and flutist. If I hadn't bought them, they would have been <laughs> cut up and made into craft projects in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So then, next week, she put another box, <laughs> and you don't want to know how poor I've been for the last five years. I was really suffering. I had no cash, and uh, it's like you know, if I ever get my hands on a, a eagle again, a dollar again, I'll you know, squeeze it till the eagle grins. That's me. But I saw this box and I thought, oh my God. I have to buy it. My mother is going to kill me. My mother tells me, don't get a haircut because you can save the $5. <laughs> you know, literally, that's where I come from. <laughs> but I said, if I don't buy it, I will hate myself for the rest of my life because I know that if it's gone, it's gone forever. So, of course, I paid the $30 and it came. And I have another 12 unique pieces by 19th century composers. And they're all digitized at the FIU site. But that stuff, you know, just go out and buy it on eBay and then give it to your librarian and make them catalog it. Because it's, if, it's, if, it, if we don't get it now, it's gone for good. It's never going to be found. It'll be, uh, uh, 
it's not even going to be a name in a bibli bibliography because those Cox cases, J.W. Pepper doesn't know that they ever existed. They're, never, they're not in any American library. There's no bibliography of American publishing from that period that would indicate that they existed. They would be vanished for Amer uh, music history. So, uh, <clears throat> so the good part is you can help music history by putting your $30 and buying something on eBay or at one of these sites. There's a wonderful site called PartitionAncien.com, which is where Michael got this set. Um, they have plenty of stuff that's 20 or 30 or 40 dollars each or less. Uh, and then you can say, I have the only surviving copy in the world of X. Even if there's one other copy, it's usually only at the Library of Paris, uh, National Library of Paris. So, uh, and they haven't digitized their stuff yet. What's the collection of uh, Vacancy Miller? Is there much in that at all? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to ask the question you were waiting for. <laughs> Everybody knows about the flutes in the right. Dayton Miller collection. So, <laughs> I love falando mal de outra pessoa. Um, I love to run other people down. So, uh, the Library of Congress, bless their hearts, um, was given this collection. And according to the, there's an archives website. According to them, that site, there's 2,800 items in the site. So I went to try to track it down as a trained librarian with 25 years of experience, and I put a question on uh, MLAL, the library list for music librarians, and somebody, Robin, Robin Rausch, somebody from LC said, oh yeah, you, it's not in WorldCat because it's in our old online catalog, and you should look under the class number blah, and I looked under the class number, blah, and I got 500 results. And then I thought, 500, it's supposed to be 2,800 according to this other source. So, I'm, I would hope that the Library of Congress still has the other 2,300 items. Mm -hmm. But, there's no way in hell you can find out what they are, because even they don't have a catalog. Mm. So. Mr. Miller gave them their flutes, mm -hmm. and he gave them 2,800 pieces of music, and at best, 500 of those have been cataloged. So that's less than 20%. And really, that's 2,800 volumes. That's huh. not pieces of music, because I had a student who went there once and was looking, and they had, they had a, a kind of internal list that said the first piece in the volume. Oh. And it didn't say anything else that was in the volume. So you'd so, have ten pieces, you know, by different composers. All, the only one they knew about was the first. If we could do one thing that would improve the life of the flutist and the historian of flute music, it would be make the, the Library of Congress actually catalog every single piece that they have. Good luck. Collection. Good luck. <laughs> it won't happen. So, you know. So what happens if you go there? Person. You don't know what there is there. How can you go? You can't believe it. They won't let you look on the shelf. Yeah. At least if you go here, it's probably they won't let you look on the shelf, right? If you ask nicely. <laughs> but this is the situation of, of music cataloging everywhere. Um, there was a wonderful uh, lecture given by Suki Summer at the inauguration of the Richard French uh, memorial librarianship position at, as the head of the Harvard Music Library. And she said to the assembled audience, she said, we all have stuff in a box. In other words, every library has stuff in a box that's sitting in the corner of the librarian's office. It was given, they don't have time to deal with it, and they don't have money to deal with it. And so that's the good thing, that someday somebody will look into the box and find what was in there. So I asked my head of special collections, do you have any music down there? And she said, I have this box. Uh, and it was had been there, she's been there for 29 years. It had been there at FIU since before she got there. They had one sort of half-assed, excuse me, French, uh, finding list, which didn't have the right main entries or anything. Um, and that was, and that was only on a piece of paper in a file. 
So if you looked at the online catalog, you would have no clue that that collection even existed. So what was it? It was a box that had 133 individual items which were uh, songs, classical songs for, for voice and piano, uh, which had been collected by one collector and given to FIU um, from the period 1880 to 1910 in London. Very specific collection. And again, usually the only other source for these things was in the uh, British Library. And the British Library, bless their hearts, ha um, certainly has not cataloged their material, and they haven't put any of <coughs> them online as scans. So um, that's the good thing, is that we can think that someday all these, you know, the other missing Bach passions will surface, and you know, the rest of the wonderful missing pieces like the Telemann missing this and the Telemann missing that, they may someday reappear. Like the set of flute sonatas that was in Kiev for 50 years and now they're in Berenreiter. But we have this music and we can make it available. We just, you know, it's the, the cost of the server is, is minimal. We just have to make it possible for each other to know about this and we have to incentivize our libraries to do it for us. We're, you know, we librarians are the ones who have the expertise and the equipment, and all we need is to have the deans say that this is something, preserving our intellectual heritage is something that is fundamental and has to take priority. Because if we don't do it, it will be lost forever. It's like the, everybody saw Nine of the Rose, right? What was the, the MacGuffin that operated the plot? It was the fact that this one monastery library had uh, Aristotle's lost treatise that we know was written on comedy. And they tried to destroy it. They burned down the monastery in order to destroy this thing on comedy. But usually there's just one copy that survives. And if it doesn't survive, that's it. So. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.